I read the end of the book and you're a winner. Come on, church. You can go over the other side. Your promised land lies beyond the Jordan. But you've got to be willing to understand the power and the anointing of that. So you've got to live in hope. Our world has cast off all restraint. And no offense, this is why we see much of what we see in our world today is because people don't have hope. But we're not people with no hope. Place your hand on your heart and say, I have hope in God. I expect great things in Jesus' name. begin with saying I firmly believe that in Romans chapter 12 too it begins to describe something to us that is absolutely pertinent for life it is an imperative thing that we do and that is renew our mind because our world in which we live tries to rob us from really the thoughts and the goodness of God but so often what happens in our life is not only that happens but we allow some of the old patterns the old ways the things in the past a lot of things to kind of if you will, creep back in even after we know the Lord Jesus Christ, our personal Savior. And I believe, like that says there in verse 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Amen. Everybody say, the perfect will of God. Will of God. Say it out loud, the perfect will of God. Now, the amazing part about that is, in fact, as I was kind of reflecting on this for today, the Lord began to show me something, and I really believe it in my heart. I believe there is a submissive will of God and a perfect will of God. And let me describe the difference. The submissive will of God means that you love God, you haven't turned your back on Him, you're fulfilling everything that God desires for you to do in a certain way. You're coming to church, you're reading your word. But then there are other things you might be avoiding that God has told you to do. Come on, I'm preaching better than your amen in here. I know in my own personal life, I was living many years in the will of God. But I was not living in the perfect will of God. I avoided ministry for almost two and a half years before I finally said yes to the call of God. And yet I knew prior to that that I was called to minister the word, but I was insecure in many things and I felt I can't be a pastor, I'm not perfect. Well, God never told us to be perfect. What he told us is to be available. And a lot of people misunderstand perfection with holiness. Holiness is a lifestyle. It's not what you wear or that you're perfect, but what it is is you finally grow up into maturity somewhat, and you quit avoiding when God speaks to you. Things like this, which would be maybe something simplistic, but maybe God would tell you to go and on Thanksgiving and invite somebody to your house and have a dinner that you know is maybe struggling or whatever. And you will immediately begin to think, well, I'd love to do that, but I haven't had time to clean my house. I haven't had time to do How many of you know you can still love God and not do that? Amen. Amen. And you can be in a submissive will of God and not do that. But to be in the perfect will of God, you've got to do what he said when he told you to do it. And this is what a renewed mind does in our life. It brings us... It not only says, don't be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed, that you might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect. Why would he add that word, Why would he add that word in there? Why wouldn't he just say, the will of God? Because there is a difference between the will of God and the perfect will of God for our life. The perfect will of God takes us in a little further than we've ever been. The perfect will of God is what Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane when he said on the third time, he went in a little further and said, not my will, God, but your will be done. Now, how many of you know that is a will 
But there are different levels to that will. But without a renewed mind, we will never submit many times to what the will of God is. Not unintentionally. There might be fear, insecurity, excuses that we can make. But how many of you know God desires for you to renew your mind that you may prove what is that perfect will of God? That's right. Everybody say perfect will. perfect will. Now the perfect will of God means that we are going to surrender to what God wants. And if we're going to do that and renew our mind, number one, we talked about we've got to live in forgiveness. Everybody say forgiveness. forgiveness. The word says that God forgives us if we forgive others. And I want to tell you, this is one word that we don't have power a lot of times in our own strength to do. Because all the emotions and all the hurts and all the feelings are there. So we have to call out on God to really, but you can forgive or he wouldn't tell you to do it. God would never tell us to do something we didn't have the power through him to get done. Then we also talked about how many of you know if we're going to live and renew our mind, we've got to let go of the past. Everybody say the past. God's a future thinker. Just go like this. God gave me two eyes. In the front of my head, not in the back of my head. We're not to live life in the rearview mirror. We're to live life going forward. God can't change the past, but he can change the future. And that anointing and that blessing that comes with the future, we have to understand that we can't fill our hands. Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, that's this one thing I do, I let go of those things which are behind and I reach to those things that lie ahead. How many of you know you cannot fill your hands with the past and reach for what God wants for you in the future? If you're filling your life with the past, you're thinking of all the sorrow, the misery. And listen, I do not minimize that. People have been hurt, people have been abused, people have been physically and emotionally and even mentally abused. I am not saying the person was right to do that, but you cannot live in that. If you live in that, you're losing your future for what God has for you. You've got to let go of those things. Everybody say, let go. Let go. And let God. let God. In other words, if you'll do that, then the anointing and the blessing of God will come forth. We also talked about we need to live in hope. Everybody say, hope. hope. How many of you would agree that our world doesn't have a lot of that word today? In the Old Testament, it says these words. It says that we have vision, but a people without vision casts off all restraint. Hope is vision. Without a vision, you have no hope. If you don't have hope in the future, you're the most miserable of all people, is what the scripture says. Now, it might not be bright in America, but guess what? You're only passing through here anyway. <laughs> This is not the final chapter. The final chapter is not written in your life yet. This is what the word calls a blinking of an eye or a measurement that we go through that is in God is nothing because how many of you know that God doesn't live in time? Time lives in God. He was before there was any time. And he will be when time ends. But we need to recognize that we are made in his image. And this is not the end of the story. I've read the end of the book and you're a winner. Come on, church. You can go over the other side. Your promised land lies beyond the Jordan. But you've got to be willing to understand the power and the anointing of that. So you've got to live in hope. Our world has cast off all restraint. And no offense, this is why we see much of what we see in our world today is because people don't have hope. But we're not people with no hope. Place your hand on your heart and say, I have hope in God. I expect great things in Jesus' name. Now give the Lord a praise clap if you really believe that in here. And then we talked about that you have to live in faith and not by sight. How many of you know your eyes can fool you? Come on, church. That mountain might be a mountain, but it can be moved no matter what your eyes are trying to tell you. The Word says that it's impossible to please God without faith. Without faith, we really can't get done the things we need to do. But with faith, in fact, I remember a story. I've told this before, but it's so apropos here. Um, I remember we went to Alaska a number of years ago, Pastor Sandy and I, some friends, actually, when we moved here to start the church, 
they moved to Alaska and he went, for, went to work for the airport in Anchorage. And so they said, well, let us send you tickets and, and please come and visit us because they were our best friends in Red Bluff. So we flew up there and one of the first places they took us in Anchorage was they took us to this, it was kind of like Disneyland. How many of you ever flown over, soaring over California, Disneyland, or the, I guess they have a new ride now. And you know how your eyes can fool you. You know, you're set up in the seats and they bring you up and you can smell the oranges when you go over the orange. Come on, church. It's okay to be a kid. It's, it's okay. And you know how enjoyable that is. But we were setting stationary. We were in a we were in a theater that had a big screen and an airplane was flying over Alaska. You got to go over Alaska in 45 minutes. You know, you've seen the whole, which is the largest state in the union. I mean, it can, you can put five of California in Alaska. And we were sitting in these benches. They were actually wood benches and you lean back in the screen. And I remember even my, our eyes fooled everybody because we flew over this huge mountain and on the other side there was a great crevasse. And everybody went, verbally went, Ooh. <laughs> Whenever you can, res you can respond to what your eyes are seeing, it's not really happening. And I remember the plane, a few minutes later, it made a bank like this, and the camera banked with the plane, and everybody in the entire place went. <laughs> now, nothing was moving. The seats were not rigged like some of the rides. You were in a stationary position but your eyes begin to fool what you were seeing and your body responded. That's why it said to live by faith and not by sight. Too many people live by only what they see rather than the power and the word of God. Rather than that anointing. Your eyes, just tap your neighbor and say, my eyes can fool me. And then this is where we left off. If we're going to understand the real power of God, there's one thing you're going to have to do. You're going to have to be in the Word of God. The Word of God is the power source of all you need in life and is the power source of the anointing that destroys the yoke. You will never renew your mind outside of the Word. If you not, do not download the Word of God into your life, much like you download an app, why do you download that app? You download that app so you can either draw things from off of the internet or wherever it's coming from or to get information or it works for a certain thing. That's the same way the Word of God. You can never renew your mind outside of the Word of God. Right. You can pray, you can love, you can have faith, you can do all these things, but how many of you know the Word of God is the source you renew your mind with? And if you do it with any other thing, what begins to happen is it's corrupt because the Word of God has the power and why many people don't want to do this. Hebrews says, for the word of God is alive and powerful. Everybody say alive. alive. This is a living book. It is more than ink on paper. It has the power to change and move mountains. It has the power to heal, deliver, and set free. And if we begin to recognize how powerful this word is, we hide it in our heart. David put it this way, I put it in my heart that I may not stumble against God. He said, I know the word of God because it is a light to my path. In other words, we're going to know how to operate in a dark and dying world. We're going to have to get the word of God downloaded into our heart. And when we download the word of God, then we can renew our mind. Because now we know what the word of God says. And why do I say this? Because here Paul tells the Hebrews, and it is sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even the discerning of the soul and the spirit. In other words, it's a book of discernment. And why I think a lot of people, and this is why our society doesn't want the Ten Commandments and doesn't want the Word of God out there. You know why? Because of what it says right here. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. It is a discerner of even the thought and the intent of why people are doing things. Amen. Hello? Yeah. And so the world doesn't want that because they want to live on their own thoughts, their own power, their own... Or none. They don't want a book that's going to discern what they're thinking. Okay. I'm preaching better than you all are amen. Amen. And so as we really understand the power, the anointing of that, then what we have to do is we have to get this word downloaded into our heart. And when we download this word, it even tells us what our motivations are. What's your motivation for coming to church? Do you love my sermons? Praise God, I'm glad you're here. But you need to come for God. 
as much as I want to be liked, as much as I want you to enjoy the sermon, really, it's God that will change your heart. Amen. My words cannot do that, but these words can. Amen. And that's why a lot of times when I preach, I've had people literally say to me, well, man, Pastor, you use a lot of the Word of God. And I want to say, well, what am I supposed to use, the newspaper? I mean, it's amazing to me because I try to give Scripture for everything I say because if Scripture doesn't back it up, it's no more than a good idea. But when the Word of God goes out of this place and into the congregation and the anointing of God, it's a discerner of the thought and the intent of why we do what we do. And so sometimes that's a challenge to all of us, isn't it? Come on. But he doesn't stop there. This is what I love. And of the joint and the marrow, and is a, it is a, the power of our thoughts and the intent of our heart. Everybody say, my thoughts. My thoughts. You know, my mama told me something one time. I never forgot. Good to tell a teenager. You teenagers, listen to this. Just because it falls into your mind, how many of you know you don't have to speak it out your mouth? I'll try that over here. Just because it falls into your mind doesn't mean you have to speak it out of your mouth. Amen. James says, show me a man that can control his tongue and I'll show you a man that's disciplined in all his ways. The biggest problem we have is our tongue. In fact, he describes it in the second chapter. It's like the rudder of a ship. It's the smallest part of the ship. But wherever it turns, the ship goes. What's he saying? He's saying where the tongue follows the body. Well, the tongue is dislodged. The body will soon follow. And the power of that is that we need to understand. We need a discerner. We need a filter. Has anybody ever known people that didn't have a filter in life? <laughs> you know, they just, things just fall out of their mouth. I mean, they just don't have any filter. All right, get that person off your mind and listen to what I'm saying. <laughs> Forgive them, exactly. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. But I mean, we need a filter, amen? And that filter is the Word of God. That's according to what really he's saying to us here, that out of that Word of God, it's a discerner. It, it gives us the intent and the thought of, that's coming out of our heart. Now, that's a good thing. I don't mean that in a bad way, but I, I don't know about you. I think we need that in life. Because if we just go by our own experiences, we get ourselves in trouble or our patterns or our habits. Because how many of you know, one, one of the hardest things it is, Jesus says this in John 8, 31 and 32. And Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. Everybody say abide in his word. Abide in his word. And you're a disciple. And you're a disciple. He didn't say just because you were born again, you were a disciple. There's a lot of people that are born again on the way to heaven, but they're not disciples because a disciple is a follower of Christ. If you look the Greek word up about disciple, it means a follower. Someone that emulates their leader. But he stops and says this, I love this. My disciple indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. He didn't say you'd have freedom just because you were a Christian. He said, if you abide in my word, you're my disciple, and you will know the truth. In other words, this book cannot lie. It is a truth source. It is the power we have to live by. But what we don't understand, by finding that truth, we unlock the prisons many people are in. Because you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. As much as I love America and the freedoms of America, and I'm proud to be an American, only God can truly make me free. And he does that only by the word of God. Because I can accept Jesus and still be in prison of my own making most of the time. But the truth sets you free. And he said, if you're my disciple, the way you find that truth is in the word of God is in the power and in that anointing that destroys the yoke. I love this because it says, if you, he says in John 15, 7, if you abide in me and my word abides in you. 
Now the word abide means to take up residence. You abide in the home you live in. You've set it up, you've moved in the furniture, you sleep there at night, you eat your meals there, you abide there. Life goes on in that home. That's exactly the word he's using here. If you live and abide and sleep and eat under my covering, it goes on to say, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you by my Father, for he is glorified. Hallelujah. Come on, church. I mean, that's a good word. That, that's a good word. I'm about ready to amen myself. Hallelujah. That is a good word. Amen. Why? Because we understand that when we abide in something, it's sustaining, it's comforting. It's, that's why it says in the Psalms also that he's a strong tower that I can run into. He's my refuge when all else is breaking out. He can come forth in that and he can be our protection, our refuge, our strong tower. He can destroy the yoke when the yokes are trying to fall on us. If we are a power, he said, my yoke is easy and my burdens are light. You know, I don't mean this bad. I love you, but there's too many people that talk about the problems and not the solutions. You know, it's, it's funny to me. I, I'm getting ready to teach down in Fresno next Saturday. And one of the things I'm going to tell the people that are going into ministry, people don't want to hear about your labor pains. They want to see the baby. They don't want to hear about your labor pains. I love you, but they want to see the baby. Come on, church. How many of you know life would be a lot better if people would just show the baby? And I'm not saying the labor pains aren't there or they're not real. I'm not saying to fake them out. But what I am saying is everybody doesn't want to hear about all our problems. They want to see the baby. They want to see the result of that great move of God on your life. And that's a problem. Many of us live in the labor pains. The baby's been born, but we're still talking about the labor pain. <laughs> and look, I know that if men had to have babies, there would be one kid in every family. And that would be it, man, I'm telling you. I've been in the labor room, and I thank God I'm a man. Come on, church. I mean... I don't think that was by chance God gave me. I don't know that I have the will to have babies. But my heart is, I know it's tough, but God does not want to hear about the labor pains. He wants to see the fruit. He wants to see the baby. Why? Because that's what people are going to pat on the head. That's when the joy of the Lord is in the room. See, when we do that, then we know the word of God and the power of the word of God. Romans says, so then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by what? The Word of God. Everybody say, faith comes by hearing. Faith comes by hearing. And, hearing and hearing by the Word of God. In other words, when I live in the Word of God, faith has power to move the mountain. But if I just live in my own resources, my own knowledge, my own ability, or my education, how many of you know, I, I've known a lot of people that don't have formal educations, but they get a lot done in life. Because I firmly believe, just like faith, life is not a sprint. Paul says that you're in a race, lay aside every weight that so easily beseech you, and run with endurance. How many of you know you don't need endurance for a 100-yard dash? You need speed. And speed only. This is why the triple crown, that's why it's been won only a few times by the same horse. Because every race is a different distance. And because it's a different distance, some horses have the real ability to run fast but they don't have endurance to win the triple crown. They're champions, they're winners, but only a few can carry the triple crown. God's looking for those few in the body of Christ. 
that it's not how you begin the race. How are you going to end the race? How are you going to do when the race is challenged? And so with that being said, I want to leave you with this thought. I don't have it up there, but you can read it in your Bible. It's Isaiah 55, beginning with verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, saith the Lord. For as the heaven are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. This verse changed my life. I read this verse and had a teaching on it the first year I was born again. I was 27, and I have it underlined in every Bible I've ever preached out of because of these very things. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and does not return there but waters the earth and makes it bring forth its bud and it gives seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be. Now look at this. It shall not return to me void, but will accomplish what I please. Everybody say what he pleases. That's what the word of God does. It's finding that perfect will of God. And this is what I love. This is the promise. And it shall prosper in the things for which I sent it. For you shall go out with joy and you shall be led out with peace. Everybody say, I need to be led. I'm a good follower. Now look at this. The mountain and the hills will break forth before you. Isn't that what we just read just a few moments ago? If you speak to the mountain and believe in your heart and do not doubt the words you've said, it shall be moved if you believe the words you've said. He's really quoting this scripture, Jesus is. He said, the mountains will break forth before you. But it's this last part I really like. And this is what it says to us. And all the trees of the field will clap their hands. <laughs> Even nature is submitted to the word of God. And the trees of the field will clap their hands. Come on, church. I mean... <laughs> Do you recognize what that really is saying to us? Yes. The kind of authority we have with the Word of God in our life. That no matter what goes on in our life, no matter what happens in our life, no matter what challenge comes in, no matter what trial comes in, God's still in our favor. Amen. And when we speak His Word to that situation, it will not return to Him void. 